Genome Initiative. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for promoting me from a poster uh, and uh, for whoever slot this was originally. I hope they're all right. Um, so I've, I'm going to actually dwell a little bit on the first slide because I want to emphasize to some degree I come at this come from a, a little bit of an odd angle. I'm going to be talking about the Materials Genome Initiative in very broad strokes. Uh, but I actually, uh, am, as a practitioner, I attack it from uh, several levels down. So that's why I actually have all my my division and lab and institution just to emphasize kind of exactly how far I am from the White House, uh, which is where this thing came from. So this is an outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, do a few minutes on sort of what is material science, uh, what is the MGI, where did it come from conceptually, um, how are people, how are institutions in general responding to it, and I'll focus more on the uh, NIST response, uh, mention a few sci-fi relevant projects, uh, and then uh, uh, talk about SciPy and Python in the context of the MGI, and then close with some uh, hopefully useful URLs and uh, and things to do. So, so material science. What's a material? Well, a material is an interesting or economically important arrangement of atoms, and typically it has many layers of structure. There's the chemical composition. The chemical composition is broken up into several domains. Each of the domains has some property. The domains are arranged in a certain way. And the result of all of this is that at the global level, this thing does something you want, uh, or, and maybe one or two things you don't want. Um, real materials, uh, all materials, typically embody their processing history. Uh, they are never in equilibrium. They're not in equilibrium when they're formed. They're not in equilibrium when you process them. And they're not in equilibrium when they're in service which limits to some degree, uh, or uh, complicates at least, uh, the analysis process. So I have a few examples up here. The one on the far left uh, is a, a semiconductor uh, uh, material. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's been laid down. It's an engineered material. Um, it's been, uh, there's an arrangement, a particular arrangement that was designed that the, the people who made the material wanted to reach and, and maybe did and maybe didn't. Uh, the next one over is uh, a layered structure that whose uh, properties depend very critically on the on the difference between the the properties of the constituents and their arrangement. The uh, and the others are a couple of uh, uh, ways in which uh, um, grain materials like metals. I, I think in fact the the next one is a metal, and the one the one on the farthest right is a ceramic. But I'm not even completely sure of that. These are example pictures I've been using for years. Um, the point is there's a lot of structure. It varies very broadly across material classes, and uh, though there are interactions at every level between the structure. And material science, of course, is the study of the processing and structure and properties of materials. Uh, as I have already emphasized, materials are highly interactive, um, and material science is correspondingly interdisciplinary. Uh, there's a lot of physics in material science, uh, solid mechanics, micromechanics, to, for the description of the bulk properties. Um, chemistry, this is, this is not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination, but chemistry is important for uh, reactions that occur during processing, typically at high temperatures, and uh, some chemical processes govern the kinetics or the rates at which various things happen. Uh, and there's a lot of modeling, uh, even before uh, sort of modern computational material science and, and modern theory, there, there was a lot of modeling. Uh, materials are sufficiently complex in general that there's almost nothing you can say about them that, is, that really captures the complexity, even the most basic sort of linear response material of a, a linear response characterization of a material or a material constituent is itself already a model. Um, the pictures that I showed before um, are two-dimensional models. Microscopy is, is an approximation to real materials. The whole the field is shot through with models and approximations. So if you follow my management chain far enough up, you get to this guy. Uh, who announced in June of 2011 at Carnegie Mellon University that to help businesses discover, develop, and deploy new materials twice as fast, we're launching what we call the Materials Genome Initiative, the invention of silicon circuits and lithium-ion batteries, made computers and iPods and iPads possible, but it took years to get those technologies from the drawing board to the marketplace. We can do it faster, which we think is true. There's a URL there for the White House MGI site uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, Ah, I'm going backwards, that's why, okay. So the basic goal, as articulated by the president, is to reduce the time to market for new materials by 50% or more. And there are a couple of other sub-goals uh, that uh, we and the government have been tasked with, uh, developing a materials innovation infrastructure, and I'll be describing in a little bit more detail what that actually means uh, beyond the buzzwords. Um, and then we have, the government has other goals, uh, 
national policy goals that the MGI is also supposed to serve, including advanced materials, using advanced materials to reach goals in energy, security, and human welfare. And there's an educational component. Uh, the hope and expectation is that uh, in academia where this is practiced, this will also uh, be used as an educational tool to bring uh, a next generation materials workforce up to speed. Um, so of course this didn't, thing didn't come out of nowhere. Um, it reaches back in time and, and uh, uh, in scope. And again, this is, this is partly limited by my own personal perspective and personal history. So there were several academic research efforts in uh, the 80s and 90s that were interested in uh, really getting a handle on the uh, multi-layer structure of materials and uh, possibly actually designing materials. Um, one, the, uh, the reason the Steel Research Group in particular is called out, that's a, a research group at Northwestern University. I did a postdoc there, so I know a little bit about it. Um, there was a company formed from that called Questech LLC, which was uh, their, uh, their niche is uh, sort of small batch, high value added uh, alloy design, um, which they've been very successful at. Um, the steel research group started with mostly ferrous materials because that's where the, most of the data seemed to exist. Uh, but their ambition, even in the late 80s and early 90s, was a, a br very broad uh, scoped um, materials design effort. Um, there, I, I don't mean to sell other academic efforts short. I'm, I know they existed. I can think of some of them. Uh, I don't want to list them, uh, try to list them for fear of being incomplete. Um, government was also interested in this. Uh, there's a 2004 National Academy report uh, on uh, accelerating technology transitions um, that actually uses the genome terminology. So this may be a good point to talk about the name. Um, materials Genome Initiative I think uh, the, the reason the word genome is used is to basically call out to some of the kind of data management and, and uh, project management techniques that were used in the Human Genome Project. I don't think anybody thinks that materials actually have genomes or that you can mutate a genome of a material and get a better material or, or evolve materials in the same, same way that biological systems evolve. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the issues that comes up when we talk about this is, is the name. I think that's where it comes from. I think if, if that's where it comes from, that's good news because the Human Genome Project was very well run and, of course, very successful. Um, there's also been uh, this uh, DARPA AIM project. AIM in this uh, context stands for Accelerated Insertion of Materials. Um, and there was a, an effort uh, a number of years ago, actually still ongoing, I believe, uh, but started a number of years ago. Uh, the ICME project, which stands for Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. Um, that project resulted in a reasonably successful uh, refinement of uh, aluminum alloy design for engine blocks. Uh, there the application, of course, is ultimately lightweighting, making vehicles lighter so that you can control them better by moving the weight around if you want to, or making them more fuel efficient, or putting power somewhere else, uh, all of which is, of course, uh, commercially valuable. And I'm sure there are other precursors uh, again, I don't, I don't, uh, what I want to do is capture the idea that there was a, that, that a lot of people at a lot of places have been thinking about this kind of thing for a long time. Uh, I don't, as I say, aspire to completeness. Um, the MGI in particular's origins also span many agencies. Uh, NIST, where I work, uh, certainly we had a lot of conversations about this kind of thing uh, over many years. But the actual white paper uh, had participation from the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, all of whom worked with the Office of Science and Technology Policy. The Office of Science and Technology Policy is a, is a unit of the West Wing of the White House. Um, and they prepared the initial white paper. Um, so the precursor themes all kind of had something in common. Um, something that we noticed, or certainly that I noticed when we had, uh, you know, sort of um, conversations, you know, at lunch or, or a coffee break or whatever at NIST was that we have people at NIST who do modeling at a lot of different length scales. We have people who do uh, DFT, who do, who do basic quantum mechanics. We have people who do uh, atomistic-based, um, more phenomenological modeling. We have people who do continuum at various scales. And so, and if we wanted to, but there's, they're kind of siloed. And we kind of were frustrated by that sometimes, and we wanted to kind of bridge these length scales. That's something we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, we also knew that we had a lot of data out there, and that a lot of the data was very poorly organized and hard to get at and hard to understand. And we also knew that there's this very important inverse problem 
that the, the sort of forward problem of material science is given a material, characterize it and, and say how it behaves. Make the measurements, do, take the micrographs, do whatever you have to do. The inverse problem is um, given a set of properties, what microstructure, what processing, what composition is going to get you there. This is the materials design problem. And this is a hard problem. I mean, inverse problems in general are hard. And this, this is a hard problem that is made even more hard by the, the, the siloing in the community and the way the data is organized. Um, the DARPA AIM project and the NRC report all specifically called out those kinds of issues as well. I know that in the academic materials design efforts, that was something that was a source of frustration for them. And so we've all been kind of, you know, complaining about this at least, and sometimes even trying to do things about it for quite a while. So for this community, of course, the scientific Python community, um, the breadth of the issues, the complexity um, is familiar, right? I mean, these are the kinds of things that the scientific Python community has been worrying about for a long time, include, and, and a few other things. Um, SciPy, as somebody, uh, Andy, Andy uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the name, but one of the, one of the people who introduced uh, the uh, SciPy at the very beginning of today mentioned that this is one of the few conferences where people actually talk about science and tools at the same conference. Um, SciPy has a good history on this. It was co-hosted with the uh, distributed data applications for neutron scattering uh, in, I think, 2006. Somebody can correct the year if I got that wrong. Uh, there was a focus area of, on data science in 2011, which addresses the kind of problems that we've been having with, again, data organization and data accessibility. Um, in 2012, there was a focus area on high-performance computing, which, of course, addresses the kind of scaling problems that you face in these kinds of modeling. Um, this year, we have a focus area on machine learning and a focus area on reproducible science. Reproducible science is also one of the concerns of the MGI. So I think this is, this is a tremendous community that, that needs to know about this. And this, this slide is basically the motivation for why I wanted to come here and, and, and talk about this. The, the sort of alignment between this community and what we're trying to do struck me as, as enormous and important. Um, so the government, of course, is responding to the initiative uh, in the way that the government does. There are lots of committees. Um, there's a National Science and Technology Council subcommittee who's met, who, that has input from the various originating institutions as well as NASA, the National Institute, Institutes of Health, excuse me, U.S. Geological Service, and the Office of Manage Management and Budget. Um, this might be the most boring slide I've ever presented. It may be the most boring slide that you see in this conference. But it's important, nevertheless, because it captures, I think, the breadth of the task uh, and the breadth of the response to the task. The, the government is stepping up across many agencies to respond to the MGI and to make it, make it happen and make it work. Um, so there's efforts in data science, workflow tools, parallel computing, high performance computing, high throughput techniques of various kinds, as well as education. Um, so who is NIST? I realize now that I'm running a little bit late. So um, NIST's mission essentially is uh, metrology and traceability of measurement. Um, and uh, we have a material science lab, uh, so we are, a, we are a natural choice. Um, the NIST tasks called out in the MGI are to work with the materials community to develop computational tools, reference models, information exchange mechanisms, the kind of things that the scientific Python community wor worries about. And also, I think as of Monday, uh, we heard that our, we, we uh, are going to be putting together a materials uh, center of excellence. Um, at NIST. Um, this is the uh, nice schematic of the materials innovation infrastructure which drills a little bit deeper past the buzzwords. Uh, the out outer ring is more or less the goals and the inner little Venn diagram there is the means and their overlap. Um, so in the government, so this is an another important piece I think. The, the response at NIST in particular and presumably government-wide is framed by a couple of other things. One is the Holdren memo. This is a memo from the uh, director of the uh, OST, OSTP out of the White House, which commits federal science agencies to increase public access to results of research funded by the federal government. There was also an executive order on May 9th during a an MGI workshop at NIST. It made quite a splash, uh, describing an open data policy, which makes machine-readable, web-accessible form the default form for, for public data in the federal government. Um, so 
the government is really, this administration in particular, I think is really starting to get it. They start to understand sort of the fact that data in aggregate is more powerful than data by itself, that well-organized data is more powerful than disorganized data, and that there's, there's a lot of potential here that managing data correctly has a, can have a very high payoff uh, in the right hands. Uh, current White House is a CTO, Chief Technical Officer, Todd Park, who has a background in small business and entrepreneurship. He actually gave a, an innovation workshop at NIST on Monday, which I attended. Um, and I thought it was going to be another one of these, you know, every now and then we have these workshops and you have to go to this thing and they say, the key to innovation is to fail smart and fail fast and you know, say things you already know. But he was actually very good. Um, he actually, this, he's the reason for this slide, in fact, because I think he really gets the data piece. Uh, and so at, uh, in SciPy, uh, I think Fernando Perez mentioned earlier, there's a White House hackathon in March of 2013, which is another one of these little threads that I think um, you can use to argue the fact that this, this, the White House and this administration understands data, understands sort of large-scale scientific problem solving in a way that, that uh, government has not previously understood it. Um, so NIST, the NIST institutional responses, we're setting up some uh, repositories and pilot projects. Uh, we have a DSpace general data repository for NGI data. There's uh, composite, or, um, pilots in a few areas. Uh, we also have a lot of activity in workflow tools and uncertainty analysis, which again comes from NIST's strengths in metrology. Um, there's a significant presence of computer science working on data mining, machine learning, and data and discoverability of data, uh, all of which are, again, themes of interest to this community as well. Um, so the, there are a number of projects underway at NIST uh, that have been underway that predate the MGI, uh, which are relevant, uh, which I will go through uh, relatively quickly, uh, hoping not to sell them too short. Uh, so one of them is SciPy. It's a finite volume-based PDE solver written in Python using SciPy libraries. Uh, models microstructural evolution, uh, does anything a PDE can do, uh, including the various bullet points there, phase field evolution, phase transformations in a variety of uh, uh, subtypes and uh, electrodeposition. Uh, if you want to know more about FiPi, uh, I can direct you to uh, the principal developers who are attending this conference. Um, also, uh, you can look for Dan Wheeler to, D Wheeler's talk at this conference about using Sumatra to manage scientific workflows. It's not specifically focused on, on FiPi, but I, I'm, I'm sure it will have FiPi in it. That's at 9.50 a.m. tomorrow in room 106. That's part of the, uh, material, or the uh, reliable uh, reproducible science uh, track. Um, my other NIST colleague who is here, Zachary Trout, will be uh, talking about using IPython to anchor a workflow development effort designed to scale up investigator productivity to match the size and complexity of MGI required efforts. Um, he uh, will be talking about a, a getting a large increase in productivity compared to scripting, using self-describing data and reusable workflows, and automated dispatch of compute tasks, all, all, of, all of which address the sort of scaling and productivity issues. Uh, also speaking in this conference, he's at noon uh, on Thursday in room 106. That's again the uh, reproducible science track. Um, there's also a Pyth Python but not SciPy project, uh, the object-oriented finite element project, uh, which is used for building microstructure-based meshes, um, well adapted to the larger continuum uh, scales, and uh, this is going to be used as part of a crystal plastic uh, sort of length scale bridging effort uh, for uh, sheet metal materials and formability. Um, this is my project. If you want to know anything at all about this, I'd be happy to talk your ear off about it. So, um, again, the, the alignment between SciPy and Python and the MGI effort, I think, is, is pretty obvious. Um, at a couple of levels, firstly, Python is famously provides high-level glue code. It's, you can do rapid prototyping with Python. It's easy to learn, uh, very well-structured, uh, works for, and, uh, for at very high levels of, sophi of sophistication, excuse me. And SciPy, of course, provides uh, numerical tools with good flexibility and scalability. And SciPy really here is a stand-in for the whole SciPy ecosystem. Um, so if you drill down a little bit, and uh, this is not news to anyone here, I'm sure, uh, Python and SciPy are at the core of this software ecosystem that is selected for its power and flexibility uh, because people use it. The people who developed it are mostly scientists who are using it to solve problems uh, that they themselves have. Uh, and the Python and SciPy community is made up of tool builders, but a particular kind of tool builders, people who are, again, as I say, solving their own problems. This is not a bad model at all for an innovation infrastructure such as we are trying to build. Um, so, so there's alignment. So what? 
So uh, I can't promise you, there's no link you can click on to go get a grant. Uh, I would love to do that, but I can't. Um, but as I say, the, I really think the government is starting to get it with return in, in terms of rewarding people who build tools and finding the right kinds of flexibility and tools to solve large scale problems and solve them efficiently and well. Um, this is the kind of thing that you guys are all very well prepared to meet. What you should do if you're interested in helping out with the MGI is keep an eye out for calls for proposals or requests for proposals from federal agencies or national labs where you can contribute. And uh, a big part of the MGI is community building. Uh, look for emerging MGI communities, join them. There's a, a few URLs there. Uh, the, uh, I haven't mentioned very much about the professional organizations, but TMS, uh, one of the materials professional organizations, has been pretty good about hosting some of this stuff. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, some of them will step up with uh, a lot of buy-in for contributing data for our repositories. Um, sometime in the next couple of weeks, we will be standing up our own uh, MGI site at NIST. Don't go to that URL yet. It's an embarrassing 404 page. Go there in a week. So that's it. Thank you. So the, the NIST uh, money amount was $14 million. And where I work, I work in, as I said, in the uh, Materials uh, Science and Engineering Division. Uh, our division has been completely reprogrammed for MGI. Um, that's not true NIST-wide, um, but, but there's a lot of participation. A uh, number of people in the Information Technology Lab have been reprogrammed for it as well to, for, to uh, help with, again, the data discovery and, and uh, data repository management. Um, from where I'm sitting, it's huge. Uh, I couldn't tell you direct numbers either, but I mean, NIST is, NIST is a whole of a small agency, and so there's a lot of money for us, DOE, and then a seven fold, I think. And it's been said, I think, much larger than the money. Just to be part of the money, it's a whole different thing. I couldn't tell you numbers, but it's a whole, you know, thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.